If you can. Yeah, glory, glory, glory. All right, Emery, I see you, baby. Yeah. Is she not the prettiest little thing you have ever seen in your life? That red hair. Only God can give you red hair like that. Now, I'm serious. That, that is pure from the throne right there. I can guarantee you that. But yeah, no, you can't get that in a bottle. Hey, Bill. All right, all right. Let me get over here close so they can pick it up with this. I've been Go ahead. Thank God that I would. Every chance I got. I have a sister that's dying with stage four cancer, lung cancer. And uh, she was living a rough lifestyle. I caused that before. And she moved out of that lifestyle before she even knew she had cancer. And I know it's because people were praying for her and all that. Yeah, so I've been going and staying with her while she's had radiation. She's had 10 rounds of radiation. She's had three, three rounds of uh, chemo, and then August she's going to have three more. So I've been going up and staying with her, and she's got such a positive attitude. And anyhow, on the way up there, one time the devil tried to stop me. I'm talking about in a bad, in a bad situation, Red. Being how he didn't stop me. And I knew then that I had something that I needed to do. So when I got there, I kind of talked to sister some, and and she was just so receptive about everything I had to say. And she said, yeah, you're right. You're right. That God's doing that. And I'm just thinking, where is this coming from? You know, and then I'm thinking, well, you've been praying for us. Stupid, but <laughs> what do you expect? Mm -hmm. Pray expectantly. Pray expectantly. And so that, that's why I'm telling this, because she told me that she said something happened to me before you ever came and before I found I had cancer. And she said, I moved out of my situation. And so I said, well, that's great. That's prayer. So in evidence, when I got in her car to go somewhere, I turned the radio on and the first thing I heard was Christian music. Yeah. And I said, go ahead, God. <laughs> go ahead. So I told God that however he used me and whatever he done in her life, I was going to use it to tell others. It's never too late. Keep your head up. And sister's doing that. She's got that head up, and she's a Wilkinson 100%, and she's determined yes. that she's going to be this. And the doctor told her the other day when I was there, he said, very few people go into remission from this type of cancer. He said, but we're going to fight it as long as we can. And attitude has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, and God does. God decides. Yes. And so I just wanted to share that because I told him I would and I needed to. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your prayers. Keep them up. And uh, keep your head up and your eyes on God. Absolutely, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I tell you what, that is an amazing thing. I, of course, uh, Bill's our family, and uh, we... We know all, a lot of the conditions that were going on. It is, it is miraculous, the things that, that happen there, um, even without any involvement from any of the family or anything. And uh, that's just great. And we, we pray for that. And uh, we know that the greatest thing in all of our lives is that no matter what happens to us here physically on earth, that, 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 that heaven awaits us if we know the Lord. And that's the key to everything and this is, not, this is not as good as it gets. As a matter of fact, this is as bad as it gets for anybody that's a child of God. This is about as, this is about as troubled a land as you'll be in if you belong to the Lord. Everything from here on gets better and better and heaven is waiting for us and we believe that and, uh, and all of our loved ones that know the Lord. So we pray for all of that. We've been in a series for a couple of weeks. This is the third message in the series that I call The Pretender. Uh, it's about uh, a, a conflicted, complicated life. So if you're conflicted and complicated, uh, you're in good company because uh, the life of Jacob is one that is just um, unbelievably intertwined with all types of activities. I, I made the mention to someone, I think it was uh, yesterday, that uh, if you, whatever you wanted to illustrate in, in the Christian life, good or bad, you could use Jacob as an illustration of it because his life was just that conflicted and many things that happened in the life of Jacob are tremendous 
uh, lessons for us. They, they give us tremendous insight into some of the greatest values that we have with the Lord because many people feel that God only uses perfect people are people that is, are as near perfect as they possibly can be. And that, yeah, right, Brian, not, yeah. If he did, then he would not, he surely would not have used me and probably anybody else that's ever lived on this earth because we're all conflicted and complicated and have issues that go on. And, and, and the good thing about Jacob's lives is you see how God uses him and his, I mean, his, his boys become the 12 tribes of Israel, if that tells you anything. And uh, in spite of all of these things, I'm going to tell you, we're going to read two chapters of Scripture today. No, don't let that scare you. It's good. It's interesting. It's Genesis 29 and Genesis 30. And, and, it, and it just, it's just the story of a single event in his life. And when I read it, you're going to just be sitting there going, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. Uh, and if I really wanted to make a big deal out of it, it would be, you know, it could be quite shocking. And I'm going to try to stay away from uh, some of the obvious things about it. But, but uh, it's just real, really right here for us to see. And um, I, I, I don't want you to let this fact get by you because you may, if I don't mention it, Everybody that you see in this cast of characters in this story today, every one of them are trying to control their future. They're all trying to manipulate their destiny. So the Pretender series is about finding yourself like the prodigal son did when no man gave him anything and the Bible says, and he came to himself because none of us will ever come to God until we first come to ourselves. And, 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 and we are the person that God created us to be and we're not hiding behind faces and masks and uh, decisions and, and all of those kind of things. So this is about being real, all right? Let's, re let's begin, let, let's notice now uh, how these tendencies begin to play out in our own lives. And you'll see yourself here, I know, many times. Genesis 29, let's begin at verse one. So Jacob went on his journey and he came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in the field and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of the well, they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now, because the stone was so large and so heavy, they had a strategy about, about removing the stone and, and watering the animals. And here it was, verse three. Now, all the flocks would be gathered there and they would roll the stone from the whale's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the whale's mouth. So the strategy was, we wait until everybody gets here. We wait until all the shepherds bring their flocks in here, and all the shepherds are here because this stone is so heavy that we, it, all of us need to move this thing so no one gets hurt. So that's the way we go about doing things. All right, verse four. And Jacob said to them, my brethren, uh, where are you from? And they said, we're from Haran. Then he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, uh, we know him. Uh, Laban is, is craftier than Jacob is. So I'm not sure that, that was such a positive thing. Jacob didn't know this at the time, but they said, yeah, we know him. Uh, verse six, so he said to them, uh, is he well? And they said, he's, he's well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with his sheep. Then Jacob said, look, it's still high day and it's not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. Now, there's nothing like a, a new guy who just pops into town to, to, to tell, start telling you immediately how to go about doing your job, right? All right? So this is the kind of guy Jacob is. He's telling them now, hey, it's not time. Why wait? Blah, blah. All right. I mean, as a matter of fact, you remember Jacob even tried to tell God that he didn't do his job right. Because remember, when he was born, he was grabbing onto Esau's heel as if to say, Esau, you need to be born second. I need to be born first. So this is the kind of guy Jacob was. Verse eight, but they said, uh, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. Got it, new guy? 
That's what we do. All right. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, yes, this is his cousin, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Obviously, there is no limit to the lengths that men will go to to try to impress a woman, especially a hot woman. <laughs> How many of you guys have ever worked out in a gym in your life? Have you ever worked out with a group of people, like a group of other guys, two or three of guys working out in a gym? Have you ever been in there with them? And I know you're all sitting there trying to look straight ahead as if you didn't, don't know what I'm talking about. But I used to work out 25 years or more, I did. And I'm gonna tell you something. When, when, a, when, a, when a woman walked in to a gym with a bunch of men in it, it changed everything. Because all of the men all of a sudden uh, f flew into the impress mode and jumped on, somebody jumped on the bench and put a weight and said, all right, put some, more, put some more weight on that bar. Put some more weight on that bar. Yeah, all right. Yeah, oh, no, no, wait. That's not enough. Put that. You got me spot? Okay. Yeah. I mean, to impress a young lady... <laughs> <laughs> is the height of activity, especially, like I said, you know, one that's nice looking like Rachel is about to be described to you. She is a beautiful woman. And, uh, and here Jacob is single-handedly now, single-handedly, goes over to the stone, bench presses the stone, moves it out of the way, says to Rachel, did you see me lift that stone? Yeah, come water your sheep, baby. I'll, I'll, hey, I'll water your sheep any day, you know. All right, you got the picture. Verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. What a kiss. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this is a pretty forward thing, right? I mean, you just go over there and kiss. Yeah, you see me lift that stone? Come here, baby. You know, this was really more of a cultural thing, so it, it doesn't sound, it's not as bad as it sounds like it was. There's a lot of cultural stuff and a lot of us customary stuff. Obviously, some of it was highly emotional, though. Um, all right, so let's summarize so far. Let's summarize so far. Here is Jacob. How old do you think Jacob is here? I know most people are thinking, well, he's a young man. He's probably 25, 30 years old. No, Jacob is 76 years old. Remember? Remember when he deceived Esau from the, from the, the blessing, when he put the skin on his arms and his neck? and He was 76 years old. That's what sent him away from home. Esau said, I'm going to kill you. Next time I see you, don't let me see you again. I'm going to kill you. And so... Uh, Jacob's mom, uh, uh, Rebecca, said, uh, you know, it's, it'd be a good time for you to uh, take a vacation. Uh, why don't you go to Uncle Laban's house, my brother? So here he is on the way to Uncle Laban's house. This is what happens. So here Jacob is, 76 years old. He's never been married. He is now uh, meeting his future wife while he's on the run as a fugitive, because of something that he did to himself. So I think we could all say, all right, this would be an example of unexpected blessings. You don't expect to find the blessings of God when you are on the run from an activity that you initiated that was wrong and somehow God's gonna bring some blessing into your life while you're on the run from what you did and what you caused? Certainly unexpected blessings. Let's go on, verse 12. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So Jacob told Laban all these things. Now, this is cultural politeness because I've read the story. And, and let me just tell you this. Uh, Laban does not have good intentions for Jacob, which just, I'm just gonna jump right in here and give you a, a, a couple of lessons real quick. Number one, Everybody that hugs you 
and kisses you doesn't necessarily want what's best for you. Second lesson, everyone that's good to you may not be good for you. Lesson number three, when people come into your life, no matter how good they seem, no matter how positive they seem, you always need to watch for their motives. So Laban said to him, surely you are bone of my bone, you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you're my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Name your price. What your salary do you want? Let's make a deal. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. So no matter how you try to translate it, I did, I tried to translate it in every way possible. The, the closest I came to weak eyes being a compliment at all was uh, delicate. Her eyes were delicate. Uh, I, I think this is the Bible's way of saying uh, Leah had a great personality. I mean, you know, it was like, they're like, well, what does she look like? Well, you know, she has such a great personality and she is just sweet. She has a good heart. She's a good woman, you know. And before I say anything and hurt somebody's feelings, let me just mention to you or point out to you that it's the Bible itself that, that draws the contrast. The Bible tells us that Leah had weak eyes and what does it say about Rachel? Rachel was, man, she had a great figure and she, her, she was beautiful. So... Here's Leah, not, not much to look at, but a good person. And to make it worse, she has a hot sister, you know, and Rachel's beautiful. She has a great figure and Leah has weak eyes. All right, so no one has ever accused Jacob of not being a surface level person. So you can expect a, per, a, a, a surface level person in this condition to go surface level every time, Right? So who is it that Jacob falls for? The wonderful Leah, who may not be so pretty, but she has great traits and she's a sweet person and a wonderful person and a capable person, or the hot girl that he saw down at the well? Well, of course, obviously, he's gonna fall for the hot girl. He's surface level. Verse 18, now Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter, She's got to be special, right? Seven years of toil, hard work, hot, cold. I mean, just all of that. She's got to be, I'm a, well, I'll say that, but you know, I'd work seven years for, for Pastor Tanya. I'd work 50 years for you, doll. Matter of fact, I think I probably already have, hadn't I? <laughs> Pretty close, isn't it? About 47 years. So I, I don't know if any of you other guys could say that, but anyway, here we go. So here's Jacob. <laughs> so here's Jacob, 76 years old. Now look, what a catch Jacob is. 76 years old, he's broke. He, the only thing he had when he left home was his staff. He had to sleep with his head on a rock because he didn't even have a, a bedroll at Bethel. And now he's out here and he's homeless. But he can work. He's strong enough to work, and he says, I'll work for you for seven years for, for beautiful Rachel. And Laban said in verse 19, it's better to give her to you than that I should give her to another man. All right, stay with me, buddy. You got a deal. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Isn't, isn't that a beautiful statement, really? Even if it's about Jacob, it's still a beautiful statement about it. All of that hard work, toil, hot, cold, rain, just sweat and just, I mean, just horrible conditions out there. He's a shepherd. He's in the field. He's with the nasty animals and eating dust and blah. Seven long years and, he, and then his summation of that is, it seemed like no time at all because my heart loved her so much. Then Jacob said to Laban, 
give me my wife for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. Now that's where Jacob's mind was, just let you know. Don't you love the Bible? It's so blunt about things. Jacob says, all right, my seven years is up. Give me my woman. All right. Then Jacob said to, uh, oh, excuse me, verse 22. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. What do you suppose that included? So a little bit of, do you think a little bit of alcohol might be involved in this thing? Well, let's just see. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. Who did he work for? Beautiful Rachel. Nice Rachel. Beautiful in form, beautiful in appearance. Beautiful Rachel. All right. Laban doesn't bring Rachel. Laban, after this party, brings in Leah. He's not past his own tricks, is he? And he brought her to Jacob, and he went in unto her. Two questions. How dark is it in the Middle East? And number two, could this have been an alcohol-related incident? Number 20, verse 24. And Laban gave his maid Zilpha to his daughter Leah as a maid. She's going to come into play later on. She has two of these boys. She has two sons by Jacob. This maid does. I told you he's conflicted. Verse 25, so it came to pass in the morning, didn't notice it that night, came to pass in the morning. Isn't it amazing how some things that look so good in the dark don't look the same in the light? And it came to pass in the morning that behold, it was Leah. I can see Jacob. Behold, it was Leah. (laughs) It was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? You've deceived me. Can you imagine Jacob accusing anybody else of being deceptive? You have deceived me. Have you ever, yeah, have you ever opened a (laughs) gift? Have you ever opened a gift? And when you open it up and you looked at it, you thought, what is it? But, then it dawned on you just as quickly that you had to pretend that you knew what it was and you had to pretend that you liked it, (laughs) you know? Oh, oh, yeah, uh, 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 uh. Uncle Laban, why you want to do me this way? (laughs) That's what Jacob said. Well, Jacob, maybe you're just reaping what you've sown. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, for God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Maybe you're just reaping what you've sown, Jacob. You're the trickster. Now the trickster has been tricked. I mean, you're crafty, but you've met somebody who is craftier. Maybe you get and you come up and so to speak. Because when you live a lie, your chickens always come home to roost. God will see to it. I'm serious. You're not going to deceive him. You think you got by it. Uh, Jacob, hey, look, I'm sure Jacob thinks that he's gotten by with all of his shenanigans that God has let him off the hook somehow because he's been working for seven years for beautiful Rachel, and I'm sure that all seven years he's thinking in the back of his mind, boy, I dodged a bullet with that Esau thing. Whew, man. And God hadn't, even, God hadn't even moved against me. God hadn't done anything. I hadn't suffered any bad consequences and all of that kind of stuff. Now, let me tell you, God will let you think that. He'll let you think that. But, you, but, but there's always a payday someday. And here's Jacob's payday. Eventually and ultimately, it'll, it'll be morning. It's Leah. <laughs> yeah. Eventually and ultimately, you, you face mourning in life. All right, let me give you three conclusions now based on this story about unexpected blessings. Oh, excuse me, three observations and one conclusion. All right, here are your observations. Number one, observation number one. When morning comes, God's grace will still be there, but so will certain consequences. God's grace is still in effect, but so are the consequences of the choices that you've made. 
Listen, you have the right to make any choice you want to make. The choice is yours. God has given you freedom of choice. You can do anything you want to do, but the one thing you can't do is choose the consequences of what your decision puts into play. Let me, let me share with you just a little quick story about making decisions and what kind of consequences might follow. There was a contractor, big contractor, did lots of houses, had a main carpenter. He was his main man. This carpenter was in charge of most of the building. He was outstanding. He just followed all the rules. He, he, he built things to the specs and to the T and to the blueprint. He was marvelous. And it came time for him to retire. And he told his contractor friend that he was going to retire. And his contractor friend said, well, before you retire, can I talk you into building just one more house for me? And he said, well, I'm ready to retire. Well, I know, but listen, this is a very special one. And I promise you, this is the very last one. And the, contra- and the carpenter said, yeah, all right, give me the specs. He gave him the specs, the blueprints, all that. This thing was elaborate. This thing had, you know, had, had all kinds of intricate details all in the architecture of it. It was built in such a structural way to just be overwhelming. It was really a little overdone and all that. Well, as the contractor, as the carpenter began to build it, he started getting a little frustrated with these plans, these intimate details and these little things that he began to think, well, this is not necessary and we, want, we could, you know, we could go around that. And, 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 and literally what he did is he began to just build the house as quickly as he could and overlook as many of those little tedious details that he could just so the house would look good, you know, so he could turn the keys over to his contractor friend and say it's finished. And so the day came when he turned the keys over to his contractor friend and he said, here, this is finished. And his contractor friend flipped the keys back to him and said, this house is yours. I built this for you, for all of the hard work and the many years that you've served me. This is your house. So here's what that story says. We need to realize that in this life, we are building our house the whole time. What we do is building for our own lives. We build a life God has given. God gives us those specs. He gives us the rules. He gives us everything. But what we build out of what God gives us is built for our own life. So build it well. All the specifications that you ignore, all the shortcuts you take, uh, you have to live with. Uh, Serve God for real. Don't, don't, Don't live a lie. Don't let God throw you the keys back and you live some jacked up life because you thought you could get something for nothing. That, that's what that's about. Look, certain consequences follow decisions that we made and God's grace is still there, but so are the consequences. Verse 26. And Laban said, it must not be done in our country to give the younger before the, uh, before the firstborn fulfill her week. That means a week of years, seven years. That's what that's talking about. Isn't seven interesting? I've mentioned this to you, and I know all of you guys that have done anything with prophecy and revelation and Daniel, Ezekiel, any prophetic word, the, the, the number seven is complete, right? You, you do know this. It, number seven is not just pulled out of the air. It's, there's a reason, and it's talking about completion and perfection. But anyway, that's beside the point. Fulfill our week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve, which you will serve with me still another seven years. So, he served seven years and he's gotten Leah. He worked for Rachel, but he got Leah. Now Laban says, all right, I'm going to give you my, my next daughter, Rachel, and then you're going to work seven years to, to fulfill that. All right, I'm making a point because I want to show you something in just a second. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week So he gave him his daughter, Rachel, as wife also. And Laban gave his maid, Billa, to his daughter, Rachel, as a maid. And she's going to come into play because she's going to have some children. 
Then Jacob also went in unto Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. So what I want to call attention to here is a tremendous theological symbol. Now, this is not going to get, help you get to heaven when you die, but it's just one of those things that's so interesting about the Word of God because God never misses a trick. And by that, I mean everything God says about law and grace and heaven and hell and the past and the future, all of that, every time you see it, it, it remains consistent. And in anything that happens in any story, anywhere in the Bible, if it shows something symbolically, it's going to be the same as it is in every place you see it. And I want to show you this here. It, 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 it's one of those small things, but, but it's interesting. All right. Jacob comes in and he makes a deal to work seven years to get beautiful Rachel. You do the work first, then you get your reward. And of course, Laban substitutes Leah. So now a new deal has to be made. And the new deal is, all right, I'm going to give you your reward first, and then you're going to work the seven years to work it off. So what's the difference? First work seven years, get the reward. Now get the reward, then work seven years. Well, it's, it's the difference between law and grace is what it's showing here. And in the law, here's what the law says. Leo represents the law. The law says, if you work hard enough, if you do good things, if you perform well and you fulfill the con contract, then you get the reward. Grace, Rachel represents grace because when you get Jesus, you get the reward. You get everything and then you work not in order to get it, you work out of it because you love him, now you work. So for, for, uh, for the story, it's just an interesting concept that he works seven years and then he gets her and he has her for seven years. So it only seems that a few days, he says, because he's got beautiful Rachel, he loves her, and he works not because he has to, but he works because it's a privilege to serve God out of law, out of love and not law, out of uh, grace and not guilt. So we have beautiful Rachel and Leah and Jacob, all of them, Billa, Zilpha, Zilpha uh, Rachel and Leah, all together now as a big family. Now I'm gonna give you a heads up about the next two observations. The heads up is that I want you to focus on two words in the next two observations. And it's the two words that are the foundational motivators of our life. If you say, what is it that motivates us more than anything? When we wake up in the morning, what motivates us? There are two things that motivate us, approval and achievement. We want to be approved. We want people to like us. We want people to admire us. We want people to respect us. We want to be approved and loved. And then we want to be able to achieve, to be able to produce something in life and to achieve. So Rachel and Leah now enter into their life with these two words in mind, approval and, and achievement. So here's the second observation. Leah achieved but never received approval. Therefore, we can see that God selects what others reject. Verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. I'm glad and thankful that God loves unloved people. God saw that Jacob rejected Leah that Jacob didn't want Leah, that she cried herself to sleep every night, that she knew she wasn't beautiful. She knew she couldn't compete with her beauty queen sister and that Jacob obviously loved her sister and didn't care anything about her. And God saw that. 
And so God took the initiative to take some action to change this. Why? Because God selects what man rejects. So for all of us Leahs who are rejected ones, who are unloved, overlooked, not popular, don't fit in. So that pretty much describes me. Well, yep. Well, here's the word for you. God has a way of selecting you. Jacob didn't want Leah. God said, I want Leah. And I'm going to enable Leah to do some stuff that Rachel is not going to be able to do because I'm the God who selects what others reject. I see you, Leah. I've got my eyes on you. Jacob doesn't even like himself, Leah. If he was anything over skin deep, he would have chosen you too. So what is God saying to us? Get delivered from the insanity of trying to, uh, trying to uh, earn the approval of a bunch of jacked up Jacobs in your life. Because it's a trout. The thing that you truly need to know is that God chooses you. Or say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. <laughs> yeah. God selects what others reject, so God has chosen me. And see, this is the important issue of life. Not that others approve of you, but that you have been chosen by God. So Leah is chosen, but she still feels like she has something to prove. So what does she do? She starts having babies. Now, there's nothing wrong with having babies. That's the first commandment that God gave to Adam and Eve after he filled them with himself. He said, now be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's what I want you to do. So having a bunch of babies and having a big family is not a bad thing. It's really a good thing. I mean, I wish, I, I, I tell all Christians, man, I want you to have a bunch of, chi bunch of children because all these reprobates out here are having a bunch of children. I want some good people with some children so you can teach them how to love the Lord and uh, maybe be an asset to all of us at the end of our life. So there's nothing wrong with having children, but, 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 the, but, the, but the question is, uh, why are you having these children, Leah? Verse 32. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, and I put the name C, comma, a son. That's what Reuben means. C, a son. So she names her firstborn son C, a son. And uh, she called his name Reuben, and she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. So she names her son. See, I've given you a son. So what is the obvious motive for her having this son? It was to produce something that hopefully would entice Jacob to love her. So, you know, I don't, I don't think, you, certainly no one here is, is listening today uh, is, is trying to produce something to cause somebody to, uh, to love you, right? I mean, you're, you're not trying to produce something in order to gain approval on anything, surely not. Well, she was, and apparently it didn't work, because look at verse 33. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she named him Simeon, which means the Lord hears. These names sound familiar because these are the tribes of Israel, by the way, <laughs> just in case that might have slipped by. She conceived again in verse 34 and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons, therefore his name was called Levi, which means attached. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, which means praise. Then she stopped bearing. So Leah's popping out babies like a Pez dispenser. I mean, she's just having bunches of them. 
But she still can't get, she still can't get J Jacob's attention, right? I mean, Leah is a picture of us trying to produce something that we hope will win us approval. You know what? You, you, you can make straight A's. You can be a star athlete. You can be the homecoming king or the homecoming queen or the homecoming it, whatever they may accept nowadays. But until the Lord becomes enough for you in your life, whatever it is, it is never going to be enough. Because there comes a time when you just have to praise God for who he made you and what he did in you. All right, so, all right, let's look at Rachel. Rachel, all right, we know everything's going great with Rachel, right? Because Rachel's the beautiful one. Rachel's the favored one. So everything's gonna be going good in her life. I mean, Leah's a mess because she's not really wanted, but surely Rachel's gotta be you know, on top of the world. Observation number three. Rachel received approval but she couldn't achieve. Leah could achieve, but she couldn't get approval. He still didn't love her after all, of the, after all of the achieving she did for him. Now, Rachel has gotten his approval. He loves her. He's passionate with her. The only trouble with her is she can't achieve anything. Verse, this is chapter 30, verse one. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel's a picture of somebody who has it all going on on the outside, but it's barren and unproductive on the inside. She's loved by Jacob, but she's still unable to give him what he wants most. What he wants most is he wants a son from her. Rachel envied her sister. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I'll die. So dramatic. She's looking at Jacob and she's saying, look, you, you, you need to do something about this because I'm not able to have any children. I mean, she's become jealous about it now. Now, this is the point I want you to see. Both of these women are miserable. Leah is miserable because she can't be loved regardless of how many boys she has. And Rachel is miserable because she's loved, but she can't have what Jacob wants most, and that is a son. And so now we have misery on both sides. One had weak eyes, and one was beautiful, but they were both miserable <clears throat> because both of them were trying to produce something that would cause someone else to love them. And that's what happens in life when we try to, produce something that causes someone else, God or anybody else, to favor us in life. Verse two, and Jacob's anger, all right? She said, give me children or I die. She said that to Jacob. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? In other words, this is not my fault. This is your problem. Ask Leah. I, I work fine. Exactly what she said to him. He, he said to her. All right. So she has his approval, but she doesn't have the achievement. And, and can you believe that some of the people that you're jealous of are miserable on the inside and that some of the most popular people in the world cry themselves to sleep every night? I know it doesn't seem that way, but they do. And if you're not careful, you'll spend all your time trying to imitate people that are barren on the inside. Just because their life looks beautiful on the outside doesn't mean that it's fruitful on the inside. Rachel has low body fat count. She has beautiful features. She has loving admiration of her husband, but she's barren and she can't have children. Leah can have children, but she's not pretty. Does that say anything to us? It says to me that we're all drawn to notice in life what we don't have. Not what we do have and how God has blessed us with what we do have, but to look at our lives and to be saddened and to be down about the fact that we, we don't have. 
God is working in both of their lives, but that's not enough. They're not even seeing God working in their life at all because they're so focused on what they don't have and what they can't do that they can't see God doing anything in their life. They, they, they both want what they don't have and they can't see anything but their own insufficiencies. So what does Rachel do? Let's help God out. Verse three. So she said, here's my maid Billa. Go in unto her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Billa, her maid, as a wife and Jacob went in unto her. Okay, Jacob says, I have to, okay, I'll cooperate. Take one for the team. All right, <laughs> verse five, and Billa conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan, which means he has vindicated. Whew, this is a mixed up bunch, isn't it? This is like real housewives of Paydan Aram or something. You know, this is, could be a good soap opera, you know. Verse three, and Rachel's maid, Billa, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Whew. Then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and indeed have prevailed. I don't think so, Rachel. So she called his name Naphtali, which means my struggle. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpha, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. So Leah gets back in the game. And Leah's maid, Zilpha, bore Jacob a son. I can see, well, never mind, I don't even want to say it. Then Leah said, <laughs> a troop comes. Yeah, you, you, you just, you've delivered them, right? So she called his name Gad, which means a troop. And Leah's maid, Zilpha, bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy. No, I don't think you are, Leah. For the daughters will call me blessed or happy. The word blessed means happy. So, by the way, um, when you tie your happiness to another person's appraisal of you, you're not ever going to really be happy, right? And secondly, notice what's happened to Leah. Leah has gone all the way from, I want my husband to love me, now down to, I hope that the other women will see what's happening to me and they will be happy for me. Quite a, quite a distance, right? Falling way down. Verse 14, now Reuben, oh, this is a weird little story right here. Weird little subplot. Here it is. Now Reuben, now he's the oldest boy of Leah, went see a son, that's him, Reuben, grown boy, Went, uh, went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. Now, mandrake is a plant. So he finds these plants out in the field, and these plants are supposed to be good for fertilization and an aphrodisiac. So he finds these fertilization plants and aphrodisiac. All right. And he brought them to, back to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, now remember, Rachel's, Rachel hadn't had one child yet. Rachel says to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But Leah said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you ta also take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, I'm gonna get Jacob to come lie with you tonight. He will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. So now she's selling Jacob, right? <laughs> All right. Mandrakes and maidens. Mandrakes and maidens. All representing our attempt to control our future, which ultimately only God controls our future. But mandrakes and maidens trying to control. When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in unto me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. 
And he lay with her that night. And I'm thinking, Jacob is entirely too cooperative. <laughs> I mean, think about all this. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Now, all of this stuff going on, would you think God was involved in any of this stuff? All this stuff going on, this one's getting that one, and that one's giving that one, and this one's taking that one, and this one's having it, and that one's having it. And God is still involved. And I've, I've told y'all God is not as picky as we are about things. And he still, I mean, now Leah conceived again. She's going to bear another. These are the 12 tribes of Israel, man. I'm telling you, God's all in it. Verse 18. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar, which means reward. Then Leah conceived again. Boy, that Leah, she's popping them out. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun, which means honor. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah, which means avenged. And read chapter 34 of Genesis and you'll see one of the freakiest stories you've ever seen about some Shechemites and Dinah. Ooh, I, I'm not even gonna talk about it. Verse 22. Then God remembered Rachel and God, uh, God remembered Rachel. Lord bless her, she ain't had a child yet. Uh, Leah's had six, one maid's had two, the other maid's had two, she hadn't had a one. We have 10 children born and not a one of them belongs to Rachel. God said, I forgot about Rachel. Man, I forgot Rachel. Rachel needs to have it some. And God remembered Rachel. And God listened to her and opened her womb. And I just want to make the point, all that stuff that they've been doing to try to manipulate their destiny, and all, it all just got washed away with one little fail swoop from God. I mean, all that conniving and all that planning and everything that you did to try to control your future and control your destiny just got wiped away by one little thing God can do that only God can do. And he opened her up and she conceived and, and, and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. In other words, everybody was looking at me like I wasn't even a woman but now they can't do that because I have a child. So she called his name Joseph. You remember Joseph, the one that became second in control in Egypt and kept Israel from dying out there in the famine? That's Joseph. That name means may he add, may he add. Because Rachel said, I, I know God's gonna give me another son. So she named the one she had, may he add. Oh, and by the way, he did, and his name is Benjamin, the last one. And his name was Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son, and he did, who's Benjamin. Now, let me give you a conclusion. All right, get past what's happening to you, and you can see what God's doing through you. If you can get past what's happening to you. You can see what God's doing through you. Most of us get so captivated by what God's doing right now that we get so focused on what's happening to us, good or bad, that we get blinded to what God is actually doing through us. I, w I wish I could sit down and talk with Rachel and Leah, really. Not because I'm, I'm so smart, but because I have an advantage that they didn't have. Leah wanted approval, and she tried to get it by achieving, but she could never get. She never got it. Rachel wanted achievement; she had approval, and she was miserable all but the last couple of years of her life. Unfruitful, unproductive. 
And the advantage I have is that I have the whole Bible. They didn't have any of the Bible. I also have a New Testament that begins with the Gospel of Matthew, and they didn't have the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And it traces the genealogy of Jesus way back to the beginning of everything. And I think if we could show Leah Matthew 1, that she would have, would, would have been so excited about it and it would have ended her frustration. Because here's what Matthew says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Wait a minute. Judah was the son of Leah, right? The fourth boy, praise. He's Leah's son. Leah was the one that Jacob didn't even want to marry. And if you keep reading in Matthew, in this chapter, you'll find out that so-and-so begot so-and-so, begot so-and-so, begot so-and-so, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And 14 times there'll be there. And then when those 14 are over, there'll be 14 more times. And then when those 14 are over, there'll be 14 more times. And verse, uh, verse 26, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So Jesus, the Savior of the world, comes from the line of Judah. And Judah came from Leah, the one that Jacob never even wanted. So the Savior of the world was born out of the rejection of a woman who was unloved by her husband. So if you're feeling rejected today, I mean, if you're feeling like you're a failure, if you're feeling like you're unloved, all I'm saying is God is saying to us, look, my plan is to bring forth Jesus in your life out of your rejection, out of your frustration, out of your failures, out of your, your defeats. I mean, isn't it amazing that God can turn rejection into blessing? And, 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 and the one that Jacob never even wanted would give him a child that would ultimately produce the one who would save the world. You are chosen, Leah. You are chosen to give birth to praise that's birthed from your pain to produce the presence of Jesus. But what about Rachel? Rachel birthed Joseph. Joseph went on to be second in command of Egypt and he ended up saving the whole nation of Israel. And Joseph summed up the whole plot of everything we've been talking about in Genesis 50, verse 20, when he said, uh, what men meant for evil, God meant for good. Rachel, Rachel, the one who could not produce, ended up producing the child that saved the whole nation. Rachel, the one that could not be approved, ended up birthing out of her pain the Savior of the world that brings salvation to all of us. All Rachel, Jacob, and Leah, and the other cast members could see when all this stuff was going on, they were just seeing all those babies and all those mamas and all of that confusion and all of that conflict and who could make who happy and who wasn't happy and that's all they could see. But, if we could just open up a map of Israel and just show them the 12 tribes of Israel and how they became the nation through which the Messiah came to bless the whole world. I mean, here's the truth to take away. Your problem today can become God's promise 
that he'll bless your life tomorrow. And if you can get past what's happening right now to you today, you can see what God's doing through you. And you know what he's doing through you? Unexpected blessings. Oh, you don't see them. You, you may not even expect them, but they're there. It's like Billy's testimony when he first started. Unexpected blessings. This is not what you think is unexpected. And God does it in our life. All right, bow your head with me. With, with, with.